National Action Network Saturday Action Rally coming to you live on WLIB 1190 AM in New York, streaming to you across the country on a number of platforms, including Facebook and NationalActionNetwork.net. We're live right here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. Call somebody, tell them the action is on the air in the 10 o'clock hour. We'll also be live on the Impact Television Network. We're going to take our break when we come back. It will be the Reverend Doctor Al Sharpton. Stay right there. Yeah. William Griffin is the president of the New York City chapter and of the Men's Auxiliary. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. On Wednesday, October 14th, the NAN LGBTQ committee will hold a virtual town hall with the panel that includes all three of the New York City controller, controller contenders, Senator Brian Benjamin, Councilman Brad Lander, and Assemblyman David Weprin. There are so many issues in our community that needs to be addressed and the NAN LGBT committee is working hard to ensure that the New York City elected officials appreciate the importance of listening and responding to the diverse voices in our community. Here, here are the five W's. Who? The NAN LGBT committee. What? LGBTQ town hall with guest Senator Brian Benjamin, Councilman Brad Landers, and Assemblyman David Weprin. When? That's Wednesday, October the 14th, 2020, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Where? Zoom ID. And the number is 864-1103-1766. Why? To allow each of the NAN controller contenders an opportunity to address the specific concerns of LGBTQ. LGBTQ BIPOC New Yorkers and to share their vision of an equitable future for all New Yorkers. Thank you very much and we hope that you will be in next Wednesday, that's 6 p.m., to hear what these elected officials have to say to our community. We are looking for volunteers to join the Housing Committee. We hope you are among those who are able to volunteer to work on one of the most important committees here at the House of Justice. Uh, Karen Peterson for additional, please contact Karen Peterson for additional information at nanhousingcommittee at gmail.com or you may see me immediately following the rally if you wish. Thanks to Brenda Dock for the outstanding job you've done over the last four weeks. We are most appreciative for all that you do. Thanks a million for your service. The Scholars Committee is moving rapidly to build a strong committee in terms of numbers. We are going to need more NAN members to join the Scholars Committee because there are going to be a lot more work to be done. We hope you can find the time to help us. The Scholars Committee is going to be most interesting and exciting. It is going to deal with the black experience and what we have to do in the future to, in order to maintain a status quo in our community. We can be better than what we are or our focus. However, with the proper plan of the, of the speakers, we can gain a better perception of how we see ourselves. It will be a teaching moment in which all will benefit. See me after the rally and let me sign you up. The Second Chance Committee will sponsor a voter registration drive from 12 noon to 3 p.m. today. That's today located between 139th Street and 140th Street on Lenox Avenue on the downtown side, directly in front of the court. Please join them and let them know you are from the NAN, you are from NAN and ready to help if needed. All committee chairs should have at least two virtual Zoom meetings with your committee by this period. If you have not, please do so immediately. Please make sure to send them as part of your monthly report to Sandra Mitchell, Secretary of NAN New York City Chapter. She will package your information along with others and forward to national. Please make sure to keep a copy of everything you send to the Secretary immediately. All we have to do is just 
All we have to do is just look around in our community and we can see the lack of available housing everywhere. What are we going to do about it should be our focus. This is exactly where Karen Peterson and the Housing Committee are, look, are headed. Don't you think we should at least come out and join them? You may contact Karen Peterson at nanhousingcommittee at gmail.com if you wish to do so. However, if you make up your mind to join them this morning, you, you will never regret it. I, I promise you. If you're having any problems with your Zoom meeting, please let me know immediately. Thank you for listening. And please enjoy the balance of your day. Thank you. Coming back in just a few seconds. I um, want to welcome again all of you that are with us here in the House of Justice. I want to thank all of you that are with us online. We're back, brothers and sisters. You're listening to the National Action Network Saturday Action Rally coming to you live on WLIB 1190 AM in New York. Streaming to you across the country on a number of platforms, including Facebook and NationalActionNetwork.net. We're live right here in the House of Justice, 106 West 145th Street. Call somebody. Tell them the action is on the air. Right now, I'd like you to get on your feet and put your hands together for the president and founder of the National Action Network, the Reverend Dr. No justice. No justice. No justice. No justice. What do we want? What do we want? What do we want? When do we want it? When do we want it? When do we want it? Fist bump the person next to you, tell them you love. of Justice, 106 West 145th Street in the village of Harlem, and for you that are listening live on 1190 WLIB AM in New York, 
and for you that are watching us on live stream, nationalactionnetwork.net, we are happy to be with you another Saturday where the action is to give our report on what we are doing toward the action, toward justice and fairness for our people. Give a hand to our presider, Attorney Michael Hardy. And give a hand to our musical director, Minister Tyrone Richardson. Certainly we enjoyed that word from Reverend Dr. Robert Jordan to Worship Church. And uh, certainly there's a, a message we need about some of y'all just being scared. That's the bottom line scared and uh, I, I would think we needed that message as we are where we are at this time let me say first and foremost let me thank all of you for your birthday wishes and greetings and all that made my birthday last week and it was a beautiful tribute I appreciate every card every word every every felicitation and all that was done for my birthday. I want to thank everyone. Let me also uh, say that uh, today, <clears throat> immediately after the rally, you that are listening, Radio Land, many have called in and asked, are we still doing books? I will sign books to you. I will not sign the 23rd Psalms. I will sign your name. I've been doing book signings around Jersey and, uh, and the city all week and uh, people who want you to write these long things. I'm not going to write half the Bible, but I will sign and personalize it to you right after the rally. You can get books at the counter. You that in Radio Land can just get in your car and head this way and we do it uh, for about an hour or so. And so I can get on to get ready for Politics Nation tonight uh, downtown. Also, tomorrow I'll be preaching at New Hope uh, Church, a virtual service in uh, New Jersey, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. But we're doing books there after the service. So you that are in uh, Elizabeth, come and see me, Reverend Steffi Bartlett's church at New Hope who is our New Jersey coordinator. I'll be there at 11.30 after we uh, do our Sunday morning uh, radio show at uh, WBLS, our sister station to LIB. A lot of people ask me uh, how we work every day on our radio and do what we do. And I'm confused at how people can get up every day and don't do nothing. Many of us work to rest rather than rest from work. You know, there was a song years ago, uh, Living for the Weekend. And it was a nice beat, but a sad message. Because if you live to play, then what does your life mean? If you just living for the weekend, it must mean you ain't doing nothing worthwhile during the week. I'm living for every day to count. I'm living for every day to make a contribution. I'm not living to stop working. I'm living hoping I can keep on working. And if you don't face every day with that kind of vigor and determination, then you must not know why you're here and you must not be doing nothing of value. That's right. But folks talk about, yeah, I got to go again. Well, then you must not be doing something that you really feel you were born and called to do. And sometimes we have to do that. Now, I understand you've got to do things to make a living. But never give up on making a life. Sometimes you got to do things to make a living, but don't make that your life. 
keep trying to work toward what your life is about. Because at the end, whatever you were called to do, that is what you ought to fulfill yourself to do. And uh, I think that that is absolutely uh, required. Uh, and that is something that we ought to be, in my opinion, committed to doing. Uh, let me uh, also say that I want to encourage people to prepare wherever you are for voting and early voting. There are those that are finding every reason that everybody else ought to be doing something but them. And you must say to yourself, first and foremost, that you must vote and get everybody in your house to vote. You, you know, one of the things I say in the book is everybody can be an activist and everybody doesn't have to be an activist the same way. Everybody doesn't lead marches, everybody don't go to rallies, everybody, but everybody can do something. And you can start right in your house. Everybody making sure they're registered. Everybody making sure that they're going to vote. Everybody on your building. Then everybody on your block. Just go to work. And you may not get everybody, but you'll get more than we had. When I was growing up, my mother made everybody understand we was all going to church and we was all going to vote. Father left and, and we lived back in Brownsville on welfare and all of that, but we had to go to church and we had to vote. Sunday mornings, everybody got ready. Dog, the cat, all them got a bag. Everybody knew it was that day. <clears throat> and if you don't set standards, you won't have none. I, I don't understand these folk that don't have no standards, no rules in their house. Because, you know, we're going to sit down and talk about everything. Yeah, we're going to talk about the standards. We're going to talk. But we're not going to not have standards. And that's why the Bible says if you train up a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart. Training means that there must be some rails that you, uh, uh, guardrails that you put a child on. And as they get old, they will not break those guardrails. If you end up with a child that innovates everything with no guardrails, then when they mess up, you can't blame nobody but you. Because you never put any standards in them and expectations. I, I told that to George Bush when he was president. Uh, I was listening during the uh, break, and uh, uh, we had one of them read my bio. I guess it was my birthday. We go either Phoenix trying to get me to advertise whatever he's doing on <laughs> one or the other. He's either flattering me or my birthday. But, uh, and one of the things that, that uh, he read about is me starting as a boy preaching. So George Bush said to me, let me ask you something, Al. How did you uh, have the nerve to, to, to uh, preach at a young age, young boy? And I said, because I grew up in a church atmosphere where we were expected to do something. I was a member of the Junior Usher Board, and every year they had an anniversary. And at the anniversary, Reverend Jordan, they would ask us all what we wanted to do. Not if we were going to do something, what we was going to do. We were expected to do something. And I said I wanted to preach, and they let me preach it for, and I've been preaching ever since. My point is that the structure of our churches gave us structured lives where we grew up expecting to do something. It's all right, y'all put God in the door. And I think that we have got to stop the low expectation and regimentation uh, in our community. Our children live up to our expectations. 
And if you tell them there ain't going to be nothing, they'll live up to that. If you raise our children, you ain't going to be nothing like your daddy was nothing. You've already put that in their mind. Not only have you degraded their daddy, you have put a ceiling on their expectations. That's why I don't like this stuff about, you know, we got family curse. Right, 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 right. <laughs> I'm not, y'all can't help it because that's just the way our family is. No, yo, yo, if you got a family curse, then good. You was born to break the family curse. Everybody in my family messed up. That's just the way we are. Stop submitting to anything that doesn't lift you up. Well, one of, one of the things I do in my morning thoughts, I'm saying this weekend, people need to look at the people around them. And anybody that does not help to build you up and sustain you and encourage you, you need to get them out your life. I don't need no weights. I work out every morning. I don't need to put weights on the workout. I need to work out as free as I can. Y'all get weighed down with negative people. I, I was talking about my morning thought yesterday. I'd have friends come around. Now I'm boy preaching, doing civil rights, trying to go through school. And if they were just hanging around, my mother used to say, if you ain't got nothing to do, don't do it here. <laughs> People that are not about nothing should not be around you because they will seduce you into being about nothing. Well, you know, we grew up together. That's all right. But you need to keep growing. And they studied their growth. A friend of mine uh, uh, texted me this week. Went to school with me. Al, I know your birthday. I remember your birthday. You were 66. I'm 67. I was a year ahead of you. And I'm retiring and you still out there. I said, because I don't have a job that I retire from. <laughs> you was working for a pension. I was working for a purpose. Let's welcome our Impact TV family joining us from all over. So let me say that as I tried to put this out, one of the things that I wanted was when I wrote this book, Rise Up, and, and people, in fact, I want to thank many of you that have bought it already from around the country. Uh, it is on the bestsellers list this week of USA Today. keep making the best sales list because we have a message. And again, I'm going to be signing some today right after the rally, you that want it. But let me say one of the things that I had determined. The country, and, and, and I was so glad that uh, Reverend Jordan uh, hit on this this week at our inspirational message. The country is at crossroads. Yes. And the crossroads are determined by what it is, which road it is, that you choose to travel. Now, for the last 50 years or more, but let's, let's just do the half, last half century, we had started a road toward inclusion, rights for blacks. Same time they had accelerated the women's movement, rights for women, rights for immigrants, rights for uh, LGBTQ, all of this, and rights around climate change. All of this started 50 years ago in the 60s. Same time. And made incremental steps. Civil Rights Act 64, 
uh, Voting Rights Act 65, we saw uh, the breakdown of a lot of the uh, banners and, and, and barricades and barriers is the word I'm looking for, of women. We saw the ecology movement around climate change, people studying nature. We saw gays starting to be accepted. All of this started 50 years ago to come to light. And it was a forward movement, even through Nixon and the Bushes. We never stopped moving forward. Now we've got to a point with this administration that has gone to a different road to go backwards on all of that at the same time. That's the point of my book. We are not talking about an election. We are talking about a direction. This vote, whether you're early voting now, if you're watching me somewhere in the country where you can early vote, or if you are voting on November 3rd, is not about an election, about a direction. What I mean by that? You are confused if you don't understand that Monday, day after tomorrow, they are going to start Senate confirmation hearings to sit a woman on the Supreme Court that will stack the court six to three conservative on the calendar that is scheduled in this session of the court that will start a week from the election day. They will deal with affordable care. They will deal with affirmative action. They will deal with voter rights cases and women's cases. This count. I ain't talking about by and by when your children might have heard. I'm talking about you. Yes. I'm talking about you. You can get to Christmas and not have an affordable care. Yes. Or you can get to whatever the decision dropped within the months after the oral arguments and lose affirmative action. Which is the reverse road of where we are. And if we are not careful, we will be the generation that lost everything the generations ahead of us achieved. That's why I took some of our young folks to task that had that thing going about this ain't grandma's movement. You're right, you're about to lose everything grandma gave you. I have folks, relatives. My mother was from Dothan, Alabama. Her folks were the riches in Abbeville, Alabama. They had a lot of property. Great grandmother died, grandma got it, grandma died, on and on and on. If you inherit a house that you didn't pay for, didn't work for, didn't sweat for it, but inherited it. And you want to stand up in the living room and talk about this ain't great grandma's house. Well, grandma might be dead, but the only reason you in the house is while she was alive, she bought you a house. And here you standing up in a house you did not purchase and too ungrateful to honor those that paid for it. Same thing with the movement. First thing they did, I want y'all to get this now, because a lot of our people get, get deceived with this. The first thing they do when they take over movements to divert them is to sever you from those that set the foundation of the movements in the first place. So you spend more energy fighting each other than fighting the adversary. So you sit up worried about who does what rather than how all of us need to work out our own soul salvation. Amen, Lord. 
I talked to one of our young folk the other day, and he uh, said, yeah, I ran into one of our former members and da 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 da. And all they want to know is what Rev say about me. Don't worry about what I'm saying about you. <laughs> worry about what you're doing. Most of the folk, I ain't thinking about anyway. I got to do radio, TV, and that every day. I ain't got time to think about you. Not that I dislike you, it's just I ain't got that but kind of time. But if we are more caught up in how they can separate us and play us on each other, then we never get to where we need to go. And it is that breakup of the families, of the movement, that gives us a lack of continuity. So everybody got to relearn everything every generation. Because you know, are too self-centered and insecure. Because that's all it is. If you were secure, you'd want anybody to help you. But when you got to feel like you know it all, is because you're insecure. So you're afraid to let anyone even appear like they know something you don't know. I, you know, I, I was uh, uh, flying one day with a big preacher. And he said, you know, I, I don't need all that counsel. I don't need I, everything I need to know, I know. And we sat down on the plane. I said, you don't know how to fly this plane, do you? Well, no, I'm not a pilot. I said, so if you can sit down on this plane, and they got two folk up in the cockpit that you don't know, never met, don't know if they went to school or not, don't even really know if they're up there because the door's closed. They could have a monkey sitting up there with a banana. But you believe they get this plane off the ground and land you safely. Why can't you listen to somebody that you know that can travel the road you're trying to travel? You are not being independent, you're being ignorant. So that is why I want us all to really understand where we are. That's why I wrote the book. When I started, I started in the book, uh, to write the book in the spring as I saw this whole fight over voting rights and this fight over in all those areas. And I delayed it when things started happening. George Floyd happened and others, and I kept calling the publishers saying, I got to delay it, I got to write this in. And finally we put it out, uh, I finished it and put it out, but I finished it right before the march on Washington. And, and one of the things, I'm going to tell y'all something, I know y'all uh, think y'all the secular crowd. <laughs> I uh, think I'm just, you know, spooky. But I believe, Jordan, that there are some things that God will do because I believe in God. I thought it was interesting that we had the big march, August 28th, and we spent all this money making sure we took everybody's temperature like we do here on Saturday morning. Made everybody wear face masks, all of that. And we had over 150,000 people and no super spreader. But others have had gatherings much smaller because there's a thing, you know, Dr. Richardson said, our chairman of our board said something on my radio show this week, that really, uh, I, I really loved, he said, we go forward by faith. I want y'all to get this. We go forward by faith. But every once in a while, you can look back at what you got through by grace. Forward by faith, but got through by grace. Some stuff you got through, you didn't deserve to get through. Some things you got through, you didn't figure out how to get through. You wasn't that smart. It was grace that got you through. 
some of the big things that I've done in my life. They asked me, how did you figure that out? I didn't figure it out. If you ask me right now, how we pull off that March, August 28th, I can tell you the plan. But I could not tell you why it wasn't a super spread. I could not tell you why somebody in that big crowd didn't throw a brick. But I can tell you when I was a little boy in the Church of God in Christ, I learned that His grace is sufficient. Something God will give you grace. Quit bragging about what you didn't achieve on your own. It was grace. Grace on your enemies. You and I don't have enemies, adversaries. I've been dragged through the mud, but his grace made my enemies leave me alone. I, I, I remember one night, President Obama was in office. And he invited me to state dinner. It's a big deal in the political circles to be the state dinner. Because it's always for another head of state. And everybody get on their best clothes and they patent leather shoes and all that. Go to the White House for the state dinner and they seat you very high honor. And he was having the president of France. And I was one of the guests and they sat me at the table with the head of the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And she's sitting there and I'm sitting there and I'm talking monetary talk like I talk it every night. Yeah. They asked me later, what was y'all talking about? We was talking monetary talk. I don't know what we were talking about, but I grew up in Brownsville. If you say two sentences, I can take the last word and use it. I mean, that's how we just had to get over. She talked about interest rates. I was interested in the rate. Monetary talk. But as I looked across the room, and I saw one of the journalists, that wrote about me like an unbelievable adversary of mine. And he couldn't stop looking at me sitting at one of the front tables at a state dinner. And he couldn't stop staring. And I kept noticing his staring. And I know that he couldn't figure out how out of all he had done to try and stunt my career. That here I was sitting at a state dinner in the White House with the President of the United States. And the Brownsville part of me wanted me to go over and tell, say to him, look at me now. But the grace in me reminded me my mother, going back to what I said earlier, raised with status. My mother made me read that scripture. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemy. So as I sat there and ate, rather than be arrogant to him, I was thankful to God because God promised that if you're faithful over a few things, he would make you rule over many. Mama taught me. And sometimes you get in the way of your own blessing. Because rather than thank God, you act like you did it on your own. It was grace. I did a show this week with brother uh, named Carlos Wilson got a show. It's on my Instagram. And he asked me, how did you go and do what you did in activism? And I told him, let me tell you something. I started preaching before I started activism at 12. Became youth director for uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson and Bill Jones in New York at 13. When I signed into the movement, became youth director, 
There was no career plan. I could not have said if I do this, I'll end up with a show on MSNBC. There wasn't even an MSNBC in existence when I was 13. There wasn't no cable TV. Or I'll be all right with the black president. We didn't believe there would be a black president. If you answer your calling, God got more for you than you can imagine. Because you don't know the future, but he knows the future. And if you submit in the present, God will bring you where you need to be in the future. You too busy planning yourself rather than submitting to the plan God have on you. Now wait a minute, Reverend, how, how do we do that? Your own inside instincts show you the direction God got for you. God don't speak with a microphone in your bedroom. God speaks to guiding your what your comfort zone, where you find your thing click. It's like sit down in front of a laptop. It don't work unless you can put the password in. You lose your laptop, you lose your iPad. Somebody can get it, but if they don't know the password, they can't use it. Your calling is when you know that this click and it turns you on. Guys my age wanted to pastor big church, but the lights didn't go on, didn't click with me. But human rights and civil rights and organizing and preaching everywhere, that clicked with me and I followed that. And if you seek ye first the kingdom, what he put you in the kingdom, all these other things will be added to it. That's why when, when I tell you all about voting and standing up in these times, it is to keep those doors open and to open up new doors so that people can express and expand on their calling. I watched the other night this debate between Vice President Pence and Kamala Harris. And I looked at it probably differently than most. I looked at the fact that when I was 18 years old, 1972. I worked on Shirley Chisholm's campaign for president. Uh -huh. And everybody, and I wrote about this in, in the book, and everybody said Shirley shouldn't run, what she can't win. Black leaders wouldn't support her. Said woman shouldn't be out front. I'm talking about I was in the room and heard them say that. Right. They had the National Black Political Convention in Gary, Indiana that year. They did not even invite Shirley to come. And she was a presidential candidate. Yeah. But Shirley kept running anyway. And told me, Al, don't worry about, she used my whole name, Alfred. Don't worry about when people are not with you you go and do what you supposed to do. And she was fired up. And I thought about how I lived to, from Shirley to seeing a black woman sit on that stage as the Democratic nominee for vice president and on her way to be vice president only one term after a black president. You know one of the things that is driving Donald Trump crazy is that if he is sandwiched in history between a black president and a black woman vice president. It's like 
Heaven giving us two slices of bread. Toasted bread. A black president, a black female vice president, and a hot bigot in the middle. January, I'm gonna have hot bigot sandwiches here. An Obama slice, a Harris slice, and a hot bigot in the middle. Just pour hot sauce on. <laughs> and for Pence, who has been just as bigoted as Trump. To sit there and a black woman be as smart as smart and could keep every point going and never lose a cool even when they let him run over time and not her and with her dignity saying I'm speaking. They never dreamed that this would be this way. But if you keep on going, you will see things that you never thought you'd see. And Kamala Harris sat there and acquitted her case and Pence unflappable. Mr. Cool, nothing gets to him. He's not like Trump, you know, just smooth. So in the middle of the smoothness, a fly coming out of the You ain't so smooth now. Because you don't even know a fly is in your head. You up there, Mr. Smooth, and the fly just all over your head. We are in a serious crossroads period. That's why I want everybody to have that book to understand what we're doing and then go to work. We've signed up since the March, August 28th. The Voter Brigade, National Action Network Brigade, getting people information and then wanting them to activate. Because I'm telling you, there are forces that are ready to turn back the clock no matter what happens. Don't take for granted. Let me tell you something. They indicted day before yesterday 13 white supremacists in the state of Michigan who had planned to go and put explosives in the state capitol and kidnap the governor. Yes, yes. Thirteen of them. And they had gotten the information from an informant and went in and joined it. They were doing drills, practicing how they were going to take the state house. I ain't talking about in the 60s. I'm talking about this week. And they were going to kidnap Whitmer, the governor and prepare for a civil war. You have people that you do not know how they're going to react or act if Trump loses. But the first thing you got to do is vote and make sure he loses. Then be prepared for whatever it is. This is serious time. And he has gone absolutely mad. <laughs> Tweeting that they are that should have indicted Obama and Biden. <laughs> Tweeting this, tweeting that. Lady asked me the other day, do you think he's unstable? I say he's always been unstable. <laughs> How do you determine an unstable man being unstable? <laughs> and now he's gonna have a gathering at the White House, two o'clock today, to rally for law and order. Invited 2,000 people in the middle of coronavirus. 
not requiring people to do nothing. That between the Supreme Court nomination and hearings on Monday and the rally today shows you the danger that we are in. That's why George's message is so profound. Are you afraid? Then I was reading this writer that came up with this. I want y'all to get this. I'll let you go. He came up with this analysis. They have this new class, Attorney Hardy, of black scholars that engage in what he calls Afro-pessimism. Where their whole thing, when you get to it, is talking about the indestructible power of the state. And we can't win. They make them great speakers and writers and philosophers that we just got to tear everything down because it'll never work. Pessimism, which is the antithesis to our movement because our movement was never built on what we couldn't get done. Our movement was always built that no matter how bad it looks, we can make it anyhow. That is why there is a difference between those that are intellectuals and those that are believers in a power that your intellect can't comprehend. So you got now the intellectuals. That's why a lot of the, li of the latte liberals, as I call them, they, uh, the enemy, they like these pessimist blacks. Oh, no, 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 we're not going to vote. We're not going to uh, engage in any of those things. That's in the, everything is wrong. Pessimist, Afro-pessimist. This leader is crooked. That preacher is bad. Don't listen to this. Don't listen to your elders. Pessimist. And they get these flowery, poetic words. And they find something wrong with everything. Pessimist. Joe Biden did something 30 years ago that we didn't like. And he did, but we straightened that out. Kamala Harris wore the wrong stockings to her prom. Anything. Pessimist. Because their whole thing is to beat down the hope of the people. What made our movements was Dr. King didn't go to Washington in 63 and say we can't make it. He said despite the darkness of the hour, I still have a dream. Leaders, visionaries, people that change history is people that dream past their reality and change their reality. That's why Obama's book had hope in it. Jesse used to talk about keep hope alive. If you can't drive people with hope, you can't lead them nowhere with despair. I don't need nobody to give me an intellectual interpretation of how bad I'm doing. Tell me how I can get up and do something about it. Well, Reverend, let me give you the theoretical, uh, oh, yo, you must listen to the paradigm shift here. Wait, no, no. How are we going to do something about this? And you engage in a lot of intellectual Afro-pessimism. That's why I'm telling you again, don't hang around folk that major in your limitations and major in what you can't do. You don't know what you can do until you get up and try to do it. And everybody that God used were unlikely people and didn't believe that God could use it because they felt that they were not at the level to be used. Well. But let me tell you something, you don't need no qualifications for God to use you.
reading the story of Gideon. Gideon was chosen to fight the Midianites. Turn to Judges 6 chapter. Give me about the 36th verse. Read. And Gideon said unto God. And Gideon said unto God. This is Gideon talking to God. God had come and, and, and said, he sent an angel to say that God had chosen you, Gideon, to lead your people, to deliver your people out of the hands of the Midianites. Now, Gideon couldn't believe that God chose him because he was the less of his people. Some of y'all know what it is. Y'all didn't have no pedigree, no background. When I started, my daddy wasn't a preacher. And my granddaddy wasn't a preacher. I didn't have none of that pedigree. All the big preachers, third or fourth generation preachers, I didn't have none of that. I went to Brooklyn College, left before graduation there. They had all kind of degrees, no kind of pedigree. So you couldn't be talking to me, God. The angel said, I'm down here under the wine press. Nobody know me. The angel said, no, God chose you. And when they got all the way down to where God and Gideon had a conversation. Go ahead. And Gideon said unto God, if thou yeah. wilt save Israel by mine hand. God, if you going to save Israel by my hand. As thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the floor. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it dry up upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou will save Israel by thy hand. All right, now, Gideon now is going to test whether God is really choosing him. Yes. He said, now, if this is you, God, I'm going to take some wool. I'm going to lay it down on the ground. And I'm going to lay down, give me some sleep. And when I wake up, if the dew, the morning dew, has made the wool wet, but the ground around it dry. Yeah. Then I know that it's you talking, because only God can control the morning dew. Yeah. It is physiologically impossible to have the dew wet the wool and not wet the ground around it. Only God can do something that's surgical. Yes. Go ahead. And it was so. For he rose up early on the morrow. Got up the next day. And thrust the fleece together. Put the fleece down. And wringed out the dew out of the fleece. And the dew was on the fleece. He wringed it out. A bowl full of water. Bowl full of water. And Gideon said unto God, Let thine, thine anger be not against me. Now wait a minute. God done showed him one time, Jordan. <laughs> fleece was so wet that he could wring it out and fill a whole bowl of water and the ground around it dry. Uh -huh. But that wasn't good enough. He said, I know you're going to be angry at me, God. Read. And then he said unto God, Let not that anger be hot against me, and I will speak but this once. Let me prove, I pray thee. But this once with the fleece, let it now be dry upon the fleece. Uh -huh. And upon all of, the, all of the ground, let there be dew. Now, I want to reverse it now. Because I got to be sure. Because I still can't believe you want to use me. Why am I doing this? Because some of y'all sitting right here this morning. God done called you to do something. And somebody done told you you can't do it. You ain't got enough money. You ain't got enough education. You ain't got enough finesse. You don't got enough context. You don't know enough people. God, you couldn't be talking to me. Like God needs your education or your pedigree, or your contacts to do what he want to do. If you would submit and know God is calling you, all that you need, he will provide. Yes. But the providing comes after your submission, not your submission before. Read. And God did so that night. So God said, okay, I'll give you a second time. Now he wants the wool to be dry and the ground to be wet. Imagine that you're going to test God. But God said, okay, fine. We. And God, and God did so that night, for it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew all on the ground. Okay. Uh -huh. Come on. <laughs>
What's my point? Think of your life. Thank you. Think of the times that God showed you that he was with you. I ain't talking about the stuff we know about. Brothers sat up and read my bio this morning. The whole lot of stuff that he couldn't read because I ain't never told nobody. <laughs> and you got a whole lot of stuff in your life that you ain't never told nobody. But it's those unspeakable corners you were in that somehow you got out of anyhow. It was those situations that broke you. But somehow you kept going anyhow. It was those things that broke your heart, yet the pieces kept working anyhow. That's where God showed he was with you. How many times God got to show you before you say, yes, God has chosen me to do this work and to be part of this work. I remember when Obama was ending his presidency. Uh -huh. And people said to me, we building a civil rights museum here and we gonna do a lot here. The developers that done bought these two blocks had to make a deal with us and I said, I'm gonna go on, sit up and be the head of a museum and get old gracefully. Uh -huh. But then Trump won. <laughs> and the board of NAN met and said, we can't, you can't leave us now. You got to bring us through this Trump era. Well, nobody in there knew Trump like I did. And I know that Trump ain't smart, he's slick. And I know he's a bigot, but he's a blowhard. And sometimes you can't sit down when you get ready. Because God said, if I rise you up, I'll tell you when you're going to sit down. And if you submit to his will, and if you test him, he'll get you through things that you never thought he will make the morning do operate for you if you submit to his will and answer the call on your life. Y'all know you got that with your cell phone three-way call. When God called me, it wasn't no three-way conversation. That's right. He didn't have to put you on the line. He was talking to me. I know what God did for me. I don't know what he did for you, but I know what he done for me. And this is the time that we live. These are the hours that we live. Joe, right now, as we are at the fault road, Look at which way we go. Whether we going back or forward. We're at the fault of destiny right now. And the question is, are you going to stand up and be a part of letting God use you to preserve what your elders have built and established? I don't care what mistakes you made in life. I don't care what your background is. It is like Gideon, God chose you right now. You don't need to test God. You done already tested him. You done been through enough. And you've been part of enough. And know that God will. If you stand up, he'll make a way for you. I, I, I went home last Saturday night. Get the choir back up here. I want to try something here. I went home last Saturday on my birthday. And I watched all the videos and I saw all the congratulations, governor said one, senators said all of our dignitaries. Y'all come on choir, I won't try some here. Okay. And when I thought about my own life yeah. through my own years, I thought about the difference was that I decided when I was a little boy uh -huh. to take a stand. Yeah. Uh -huh. All my friends went for 
what was going to be easy career jobs. They were going to work till they got 60 to get a pension. They were going to get a house with a little lawn in the front and a car garage. But I decided to take a stand. Even if I lose some of my friends. I love that song, John P. Key. I want you to try this for me. John P. Key made this song. I decided to take a stand. And I want you as you are listening on me, radio or TV and you that are here to decide right now if you're going to take a stand. I decided to take a stand. see what they do up here on Saturday morning here on the radio see us on TV say I want to know what y'all doing over there I got a three day weekend some of y'all celebrating Columbus said let me go by and see what they doing but you decided in the course of the rally to take a stand you decided watching us or uh, listening on the radio to take a stand if you're here right now this is your day to come and stand and join and be a part 
of this movement for justice. I just don't, don't worry about who's looking, don't worry about who's there, just come right down to me, let us sign you up. Right now, it's time to take a stand. Everybody sing it. take our offering. You that are listening radio as we get ready to go off, we're going to take our offering. You that want to support National Action Network can go to www.nationalactionnetwork.net and do so right on our web page. You that want to get a book, I'm going to sign books here today. You can come, we are going to sign books till 1 o'clock right here. You can come get it here. It's cheaper here than in the bookstores. Right. And you don't get me to sign it. Right. Or you that want to order books, you can do that at www.alsharptonbooks.com. But I want everybody, www.revalsharptonbooks.com, R-E-V-A-L. S-H-A-R-P-T-O-N. Or you can go to nationalactionnetwork.net and flip over. But everybody in these last three weeks right, leading yeah. into the election, yeah. on this weekend that we have the Senate confirmation hearings on a woman that may be put on that court to try to turn back the clock, it's time for all of us to be involved and all of us to be supportive. There can be nobody not playing a role now. Everything is at stake. This ain't a problem for the activists. This is a problem for everybody. If you're living at a time they're planning civil wars in your time. If you're living at a time that they want to stack the Supreme Court in your time, you need to be involved. Non-involvement is not an option. Go to www.nationalactionnetwork.net and help us keep on going and you be a part of the movement. I'm so happy that uh, I remember that John P. Key song. I've decided to take a stand. You got to make the decision at some point in life to stand for something. If you don't stand for anything, your life is not going to mean anything. I end that book. Rise up by talking about how people live their lives, never having stood for nothing. And then want somebody when they go to stand up and act like their lives meant something. I quit preaching funerals of folk that ain't never stood for nothing. People talk about my uncle died. Well, what did he do? Well, I don't know what. And get somebody else to preach. I ain't, I'm tired of lying over folk. I ain't no renter preacher. Hire me to lie over somebody who didn't do nothing. If I show up at a funeral, they did something. They stood for something. They meant something. And you ought to ask every day you wake up. Every day you wake up and get out of the bed, you ought to say, if this is my last day, what can they say about me? And if you ain't satisfied with your own answer, you need to go to work to stand for something. All right, let's raise our offer. I'm going to need about 10 people. Let me get started with 10 people that can give $100 or more to come quickly. Guardians, $100. Derek Perkinson, $100. Come on, I need about eight more hundreds. Quickly, quickly. 
Play me some hundred dollar music. Wayne Tennant, one hundred dollars. How you been? Reverend Salters, $200. Winston Gilchrist, $100. The Walters family, $100. Isn't that wonderful? Come on, I'm almost there. Reverend Salters brought me real close to it. Come on, I need another 100 <clears throat> I need another 100 I need another 100 Come on. Sister said, I got it. Don't beg, Reverend. I got it. Here she comes. Thank you so much. That's all right. We 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 take it here. We take it over the internet. We do everything from sis Andrew Beard. Okay, one hundred dollars. Sister Person, one hundred dollars. All right. Now we we do it all. You can come credit card, debit card, dial in phone, whatever you got, we can do it up here. All right, fifties, fifties. You didn't have a hundred, give me fifty. Who got fifty? Come on. Come on. Reverend Carolyn, fifty dollars. Carolyn Jones, fifty dollars. Brother Patterson, fifty dollars. Linda Marrow, fifty dollars. Thank you, Linda. 20s, 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 come on. All right. Soul Train. She mentioned all the way down to the books. set up for the book signing. Y'all give us 15 minutes to set up and I'll come back out and do the book signing after the dismissal. Let's welcome Michelle Mitchell and Michelle Michelle comes 
And she not praying, she comes as a lifetime member. She's coming this morning. Give her a real big hand, lifetime membership. And certainly we thank you for stepping forward. We thank you for being a part of our justice family. You be part of us, whatever time you can put in, whatever committee you can work with, we're glad to have you. And you are right now officially part of us and we're part of you. Face the audience and welcome Michelle to the National Action Network. Give a big hand. Give a big hand. All right. All right, let us all stand. Amen. Grace. Fist bump with the one next to you, fist bump with me before you. 